Well, good morning, you wonderful people. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord together. We're continuing our new series that God has laid on our hearts regarding the harmony of the Gospels. Uh, we're looking at all those passages of Scripture that are covered in all four Gospels because if it's important enough to be in all four Gospels, it's important enough for us to know about. And so if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 3. Uh, today we're going to look at the baptism of Jesus. And uh, specifically the question is, why did Jesus need to be baptized? Why did Jesus need to be baptized? And so the passage we're going to look at is, is mostly from Matthew and John, but we'll touch a little bit Mark and Luke's. But Matthew chapter 3, reading from verse 13 is where we're going to start our sermon today. Matthew chapter 3. Starting from verse 13, down to the end of chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so for now, for this it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him, and suddenly a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son, whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. Well pleased. And that's Matthew's account of it. Uh, Mark is very, very similar, except Mark just adds from where in Galilee. Mark adds, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee. Or from uh, Nazareth of Galilee. But I like John, and I want to read John, and then we're going to break it down. But John has a very interesting take on it. John chapter 1. Don't you want to turn there? John chapter 1. I love John. He adds some, uh, some extra details that are, that are very important to understanding Matthew's take on it. John 1. John 1, reading from verse 29 down to the end of verse 34. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon the one who you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God of God. So between those four passages we get some really interesting little nuggets of truth. And the first thing that we pick up is that this is the first mention that Jesus has other than his childhood story. And so the Gospels all open with this, this beautiful birth scene and the, the visiting of the wise men and the gifts. And then it just goes quiet. And then in Matthew we get a little hint of him at an age of 12 going into the temple. And then again, quiet. Until he's 30. And so from the age of a baby to the age of 30, we're really not told much about his childhood except that he was in the town of Nazareth. He grew up in Nazareth. He uh, obviously would have learned some sort of trade from his dad in Nazareth, but we weren't really told much until here he comes on the scene. And he's about to launch his three-year ministry. He's about to fulfill the purpose for which God sent him to come and redeem mankind. And it says all of that in that one statement. And then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan. And not only did Jesus feel this desire to want to be baptized, but he had a very specific man in choice. He could have been baptized by anybody in the Jordan. But it says in our passage that he came to the Jordan to be baptized by John. 
Now, that's not just by incident, and there's a specific reason why Jesus needs to be baptized by John, because Jesus wants to acknowledge that John was the one who was sent to prepare the way. The voice in the wilderness saying, here is the Son of God. Where's in our John passage? Behold, the Lamb of God, who's come to take away the sins of the world. John recognizes that this person in front of him who is going to be baptized is the one who God showed him was going to be the one who was going to take away the sins of the world. But by Jesus coming to John, Jesus was saying, John, I'm agreeing with your baptism. And as David shared in the week, what was John's baptism? John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. That's what he cried out to the people who came to the Jordan, to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and to the, to the, the people of Israel, saying, Guys, repent! 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 So the question we ask ourselves is, what did he want them to repent of? Yes, there were some issues of laws possibly broken, but that wasn't what John was calling for. John was calling for the people to turn back to God. He's saying, guys, you've forsaken your father. It's time to repent and turn back to God. It's time to once again submit completely to God's will. Repent and submit to God. And Jesus comes and says, I'm all for that message of being wholehearted and supporting and submitting to God. And Jesus says, I'm going to show John that I am supporting that message of being submitted to the Father's will because I'm about to submit myself to the Father's will. And so he chooses John's message of surrender to God. And he says, I can get behind that message. And he comes to John. You see, this is all about identity. Identity was very important in those days. As it is today, except we've got a different take on this term of identity. Of how do you identify? <laughs> Nowadays, it's, it's, you would think it was quite obvious, but we've got some really odd things out there that people identify as. But you know, when Jesus came onto the scene, and just after his baptism, as he goes into ministry, there's going to be one question that's going to be on the hearts of most people. Who is this guy? Who is this Jesus who John has baptized? Who is he? He comes and he does miracles, he casts out demons, he uh, spends time with outcasts, he challenges the authorities, and everybody has a different idea of who is this Jesus? We were looking in the week in our Bible study and we saw that uh, many people, even his own family, didn't quite get who he was. There's this beautiful passage of scripture in Mark chapter 3, where Jesus goes to his hometown. And it says that the crowds were so intense and so full that he couldn't move in town. And so Jesus is preaching in town, he's healing and he's praying, and the crowds are, are, are overwhelming him, and his family are embarrassed at the commotion that Jesus is causing in his hometown. And so in Mark chapter 3, verse 20, it says this Then he went home, and the crowds gathered again, and so they could not even eat the family. I mean, this is houses for the people. And when the family heard it, his family heard it, they went out and seized him and said to the crowd, Sorry, he is out of his mind. Can you imagine your own family saying, Please excuse Jesus, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's causing trouble. Jesus, get home now. His own family didn't get it. The religious leaders of the day didn't get it. They said he was a heretic preaching false gospel. In fact, they went one step further in, uh, in Luke chapter 9. And they said that he is demon-possessed. He works for the devil. In fact, not even did the people, but the king of the time, King Herod, didn't have a clue of what Jesus was all about. In Luke chapter 9, he says this, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about what was happening Jesus, and he was perplexed. Because it was said that by some that John the Baptist had come back from the dead. Some were saying Elijah was appearing. And others saying that this was some prophet that had arisen from the old. And Herod said, John I beheaded. But who is this about who I'm hearing all these things? 
Even the king didn't have a clue of who Jesus was. Aching to answer this question, Jesus, who are you? Who are you? In fact, Jesus has this very discussion with his disciples. He calls them to the mountain and says, guys, what are people saying about me? Luke chapter 9. Now it happened as he was praying alone, his disciples were with him. And he said to them, Luke 9 verse 18, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Some say that you're a prophet. And then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, You are the Christ of God. Matthew says it this way, Matthew 16 and 17. And Jesus answered, Blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Disciples finally get it. You're God's son. And Jesus says, well, now that I've told you that, I want to show you. And then we read in Luke chapter 9 when he goes up the mountain and his appearance changes and he reveals the glory to his closest disciples. And so without a shadow of a doubt, they realize this is God's son, no doubt. God's perfect, sinless son. And so if we know that for sure, and he's confirmed it, and he's shown that, there's no doubt that he was God's son. Then come back to the question, then why did he need to be baptized? What did he need to repent of? Why did he go through the waters of baptism? In fact, when he comes to John, John says, no, I don't want to baptize you. In fact, you've got to baptize me. I'm not worthy enough to even carry your shoes. What an honor, what a privilege to be able to baptize you, Jesus, but surely you don't need this. You're perfect. You're righteous. You're the one who's going to make us righteous with the Father. You are the Father of our faith. Why do you want to be baptized? John argued with Jesus, saying, no, surely not. The humility of John again coming through. Saying, I need you, Jesus. You don't need me. I need you. What a prayer. I need you to baptize me. What was, what was the promise that John gave earlier? I baptize with water, but he who is coming will baptize with Holy Spirit and fire. John says, skip the water. Jesus, give me Holy Spirit. I don't want to baptize you in water. I want you to baptize me in Holy Spirit. I want power. Jesus says, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Just hold on. Just hold on. It's coming. But before we do, John, I need to do this. I need to be baptized. And then in our passage in Matthew, Jesus gives the answer to that question. He says, bar it for now. In our new Matthew passage, John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me. And then he says, let it be for now, so that it can fulfill all righteousness. Let it be fulfilled for now. What was he saying? He was saying, one, he needs to identify with us as men. He needs to identify as not just the Son of God, but the man of God. He had to identify with us. So he said to John, John, if I expect mankind to submit to God as man, then I need to submit to God as man. Not just as my Father, but as mankind submitting to Father God. And so, before Jesus was baptized, he was identifying with us. But after the cross, we identify with him. It's quite a swap. I identify with you and I'll be baptized, and then I'll die on the cross for you and you identify with me and my righteousness. I'll identify with your sinfulness, and then I'll die on the cross and you identify with my righteousness. An identity for an identity. You be me, I'll be you. That's what Jesus is saying. Guys, I'll be you for a minute. And I'll go through this water of baptism. And in the same way, he's giving them a sign of what was going to happen. I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. And I'm going to rise again.
he was identifying her so that we can identify her. And then at the end of this identification, at the end of this immersion, we see the words there that he, the uh, Bible's clear that he wasn't sprinkled. Uh, John the Baptist didn't sprinkle him with some words that baptize you, Jesus. It says, and when he had come out of the water, showing his baptism, that that's the way to do it. He was com completely submerged, completely buried in the water. And when he came out of the water, we find a similar situation to the transfiguration. Three things happened. The heavens opened. The heavens opened. We're not sure what exactly that means, whether it means the clouds sort of rolled back and the skies were clear, or whether we got a glimpse into heaven like John had in Revelation. But it just says the heavens opened. And the Holy Spirit comes down. And not just comes upon Jesus, but it says, and it remained on Jesus. It remained. He was filled with the Holy Spirit there at that occasion of his baptism. And for the first time since his birth, you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit once again united. For the first time, Jesus standing up out of his baptism water, the Holy Spirit is upon him. He is there, and the Father God speaking from heaven, saying, This is my Son. All three once again united. The Spirit descends upon him in the form of a death, and then the voice of God. And the three things that he says to his Son there is, is the same three things why we be baptized. I was baptized so that I could have Father God look at me and say, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased, and who I love. What three powerful words for a father to say to his son. Son, I love you. You're my son. I identify with you. You're my son. I'm proud of you. And I'm well pleased in that you are submitting. That's what Father God was saying. Saying, Jesus, I see what you're doing here. Identifying with mankind. Submitting yourself completely to my will. And with that, I am well pleased. I am well pleased. By doing this, he was giving them an example. He was saying to them, guys, this is important. If it's important enough for Jesus to do, then it's important enough for us. One of the last instructions that Matthew gives us from Jesus before he ascends, he says, Go into the world. Make disciples and baptize them. You know why? Because baptism is significant. It is important. It was so important that Jesus wanted to do it. Because it's a way of publicly saying, God, I want to follow you completely. I want to humiliate myself by going into the world saying, I die to myself. And I come up as a new creation, saying the old is gone washed away in the door. Behold, all things have become new. But it was also about public. You see, Jesus, when he went to John to be baptized, didn't go to John in the middle of the night and say, hey, John, let's, let's meet at the door. Let's baptize people before he wants to Jesus walked to the Jordan while it was full of crowds. And he said, now in front of everybody I'm showing you, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of what I'm about to do for mankind. You see, when we when we be baptized, it's what we're doing. We're publicly showing in front of everyone. We are not embarrassed about our decision to serve Jesus. We're not embarrassed about the fact that I know Jesus died for my sins. And I identify that I, I identify him as death for me by being in the water. I identify his resurrection for me. And I identify him being filled with the Spirit. Just like he was. You see, it was a it was a public announcement. Say, I'm showing everybody that I have decided to follow Jesus, and I'm unashamed about it. It's not just a big thing for us nowadays, but in those days it was a big thing, especially because the church hadn't been born yet. <laughs> to be identified in those days was to say that I am following Jesus. I'm identifying with the Lamb of God. He is not 
John the Baptist. He's not some prophet. He's not some Elijah come back. He is God's son. And he's going to die for me. And in hindsight, we look back to that and say, I am identifying that Christ, God's son, died for me. And I'm unapologetic about it. And so I will publicly announce that and identify with what Christ has done. I want to close with a story that I came across that I had a good chuckle. And it's about the story of Ivan the Great. Uh, Ivan the Great was the Tsar of Russia, uh, the main guy in Russia. Uh, he was around in the 15th century, uh, old Ivan the Great. And uh, the guys who fought with Ivan the Great had one big concern. Ivan wasn't settling down. And they came to him and they said, Ivan, why haven't you got a wife yet? You know what Ivan's wanted is? I'm too busy fighting for my country. Haven't got time to go and look. But he said to his people, if you'll find me a good wife, I'll marry you. I just don't have the time to look. <laughs> so he tells his guys, his counselors, his committee, he says, please find me a wife. And so they search throughout and they come across this beautiful, dark-eyed daughter of the king of Greece. And they think that this princess will be a perfect fit for Ivan the Great. And they tell Ivan, they say, Ivan, we found you a beautiful bride. She's the daughter of the king of Greece. Ivan says, I'll marry her. They said, you haven't even met her. He says, I'll marry her. Make arrangements. So they go to the king of Greece, and the uh, king of Greece says, that's great, but let's get the Orthodox Church involved. So he calls his priest, the priest says, yes, it's great, but we can only marry Ivan the Great if he gets confirmed and baptized, like a good Greek Orthodox Jew. And so Ivan says, it's fine, we'll do it. But then, his 500 close-knit soldiers say, we also want to be baptized. And so, uh, so this priest organizes 500 priests to come and do a crash course in catechism, catechism to, uh, to make them <laughs> liable for baptism. But they have one big stumbling block. The Greek Orthodox Church has one big requirement for church membership. To become a church member, you can no longer fight. <laughs> so Ivan the Great and his 500 soldiers have a big problem. They're soldiers. How do they join the church and be baptized and stop fighting? <laughs> so, so they sit with the priest and say, hey, this is our problem. The priest is very clever. He comes up with an idea. He says, all right, this is what you're going to do, you and the 500 soldiers. When you go in the waters and you confess your faith and we put you under the water, quickly draw your sword and hold your arm with the sword out of the water. We'll baptize the rest of your body, but not your sword and arm. <laughs> so the rest of you are church members, but your arm and the sword are not church members. And so from that point on, they became known as the unbaptized arm. And they still today, they, they allow you to have the unbaptized arm. I don't know, maybe sometimes today we would, we would have the unbaptized wallet. It's like, I'll be baptized, but let's keep my arm and wallet out of the water. <laughs> Jesus, you can have all of this, but not that. <laughs> See, when Jesus was baptized, he was saying, Father God, everything I have is yours. When we baptize, we're saying, Father God, everything I have. Is yours. Arms and all. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for this passage of scripture. We thank you that John was humble enough to baptize Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that even though you had nothing to repent of, there was no laws that required you to be baptized. You did it so that you could identify with us, that you would truly be one of us. God the Son, God the Man full humanity and in your full humanity you openly in front of everyone show the world that you are willing to submit to your father to his perfect will even if it meant humbling yourself to the point of death on the cross father publicly you show Jesus publicly you show that you are willing to submit to father God and father in hindsight we uh, when we get baptized today, we don't do it looking forward, we look back to you, identifying with you, repenting of our sins, confessing you as our Savior, and allowing you to bring your righteousness to us. Father, we thank you that when we stand before Father God, He looks on us in the righteousness of Christ.
looks at us and says, these are my children, whom I love, and in whom I'm well pleased, because of the cross. And as we baptize ourselves as believers, we openly say, we identify that Christ died for us. And in the same way we died to our old self, but Christ was raised from the dead, in the same way we raised him, the newness of Christ, the new life, the new creation, filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, we're thankful that we can have a part of that. We honor you, we praise you, we thank you for your baptism, for what it means for us then and what it means for us today. We give you all the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen.